Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we feature interviews with the smartest folks in mobile and growth who share invaluable, actionable, tactical insights on every aspect of mobile growth and marketing, not to mention some adjacent areas just as well. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shaman Rao, CEO of the mobile growth marketing firm Rocketship HQ, and produced by Karishma Sundaram, our superstar content marketing manager at Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital efficient manner. Our guest today is David Philipson, CEO and founder at DataSeed. When David was on the show the last time around, he took us through the history of device identification. This was a short while before WWDC 2020, and he predicted some of what lay ahead with the, uh, what we have come to know as the effective deprecation of the IDFA. At this juncture, we are on the threshold of D-Day, so to speak, and uh, yeah, a lot of what we discussed back then has come to pass. In today's interview, David talks about what parts of attribution will change by breaking down the journey of a bid into its component parts before and after SCAD network. He touches upon how a publisher needs, uh, needs to become SCAD network compatible and what they need to do to do so. Uh, he talks about the new roles of MMPs how the logic behind attribution will change, and so much more. And David also has some fascinating insights on how Facebook and Google have established what we've come to know as the current standards of data and how that might just have driven Apple to really deprecate the idea face. Uh, there's so much to think about and learn here. This is a fascinating episode with lots of food for thought. Uh, enjoy. I'm very excited to welcome David Philipson back to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. David, welcome back. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you because the last time we spoke, I think this was two weeks before WWDC, and you were like, we're very, very likely to have the idea if go away. And let's talk about what happened in the last past decade, and which was a fascinating episode for myself and for everybody. Just in setting historical context for everything that has happened since, and understanding and explaining exactly why it happened. And of course, a lot has happened since then, so I'm excited to dive into some of the implications of what is unfolding and what could happen next. But a good place to start would perhaps be to understand how world of attribution is going to change. Pre-iOS 14, in a deterministic world, the MMP would compare IDFA pre-install, compare IDFA event completers post-install, and it would do a match. So with the SCAD network, of course, there's a postback signature involved, and the postback is structured in a way that's very, very different from what was the case before. So help us understand how that impacts attribution going forward and just how the, even the notion of attribution changes going forward. Sure. I think the best thing I can do for you and, and your audience is to try and verbally describe how SK attribution works. I think if people can understand that, they can then begin to understand the limitations of it and the value that they can get from their existing MMP. Because although the attribution itself doesn't include the MMP, the MMPs can still add value there. So the, I think the best thing I can do is try and describe to your audience how SKA attribution works. The best way to do it is for me to share a schematic diagram. I, I describe it from there. So I think what the best thing for me to do is to verbally describe it. And then we can put with this your podcast a PDF or a schematic. For your audience, yeah. please have to look for the schematic diagram that Shamant will share. So I'll describe it from bid request. Because yeah. that's when all the value starts. There is a publisher um, that has a, you know, it might be a flappy birds from Voodoo or whatever. They have a bid request coming up. Everything they'll be describing up until 
the attributions done remains the same. So a bid request goes to the SSP, that could be Mopub or whatever the ad server or Fiber, their mediation platform. That bid request goes through to a number of the demand side, so a number of DSPs. Now, the important thing to note, and this is where it becomes different, is each of the demand side partners have registered with Apple. So they've registered with SCAD network, they're registered with SKA, and each of the demand partners has their own unique signature. So Dataseat has an SKA signature. Okay, so a bid request comes through to us. We'll then be using our contextual algorithms to decide how much to bid on that particular impression. Let's say we decide to bid $12 for that video impression. What is different now is on our bid response, we will be including two new variables. One is our SKA signature. So that is identifying that this bid is from this demand source. It's unique to Dataseat. And also we've got the opportunity to add another SKA parameter, which is campaign ID. It's a terribly named thing because everyone just thinks, oh, I can measure a hundred campaign. Later on, I'll describe the limitations of campaign ID, but yeah. let's just assume we bid, we win within that one bid request is our SK signature and a campaign ID. That advert is served, again, as usual, by Mopub or Fiverr or whoever. They've served the advert. The user themselves then click on the ad. This is where it does actually act a bit different, whilst in the past, there may have been a click redirects to adjust apps like Achava, et cetera. That is no longer happening. Actually, the user experience looks pretty slick compared to a day in the past. The user clicks on the advert, there's the app store, on the iPhone just kind of slickly moves up. So UX wise is pretty slick. Click on the advert, App Store appears on their phone. Once a click has occurred, there is a unique new bit of storage on an iOS 14 device, which is part of the store kit. But within the store kit, there is the SK Ad Network client. Now on that device, every SK ready click is stored on the device. You know, so it'll be data seat signature with a timestamp is now actually stored on the device, not with the MMP. If there's other campaigns with Facebook and Google, equally their clicks will be registered actually on the device itself. So let's assume that the user then downloads the advertiser app. That advertiser app, their engineering team would have configured some code within it, that's some yeah. 14 code, which says fetch attribution. What it actually is doing when the app first launches, it queries the store kit to say uh -huh. who was the last click. So there's two important things here to note, yeah. which is it is still first launch of the app, the same as MMP attribution, and it is yeah. still last click wins, which is right. similar to the attribution we're used to. So let's say launch, who was the last click? It's data seat. Okay, so the attribution there is for data seat. However, we don't receive the post back yet. A countdown timer is set. The initial yeah. countdown timer, when you won't receive any post back, is for 24 hours. After the 24 hours, an additional random 24-hour countdown timer is set, which is where you can expect between hour 24 and hour 48 to receive the post back. It will be randomly between hour 24 sure. and 48. There's another variable here, which is if the advertiser is tracking in-app events with the six-bit conversion value, every time an event is tracked, the countdown timer is reset. This is the very reason why Facebook and other ad networks, we agree with them, is advising advertisers not to track in-app events for more than 24 hours, for the first 24 hours. Why? Yeah. Because every time you track an event, it resets the countdown timer. So the longer you're tracking in-app events for, the longer and longer the delay is. Now, yeah. I can't stress how detrimental the delay is to advertising campaigns. You know, so yeah. even if you're tracking events within day zero, at best you receive the post back on day two, at worst day four. So that's why these are being restricted in that way. So we receive the post back after the delay and within the post back, there are three significant variables. There's a few actually, I'll mention them. First of all, the source app ID is included in it. So the publisher app really important and very powerful. That means that you can analyze and go, well, this publisher is converting well for me. Yeah. yeah However, yeah. I must point out, it is subject to a privacy threshold. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole nother conversation. And if we have time later, we can talk about privacy threshold. So do yeah. not expect every post back to contain this publisher app. It's frustrating, but it's Apple's way to try and stop people backward engineering and trying to figure out who the user is.
So you mm -hmm. get the that, you get the conversion value, which is configured by the advertiser. They may have done a tutorial completion, reached level five, or more advanced advertisers will be using PLTV buckets that will represent the conversion value. And the other variable is what is set by the ad network, which is campaign ID. So that should mean something to the ad network. Each ad network will be having different uses of the campaign ID. And the other important thing to note, when that device sends a post back to the ad network or DSP, the recipient sees the connection, which means you do see the IP address. And this isn't for the uses of fingerprinting. No one can fingerprint from SKA because of the delay. You know, it's another benefit yeah. with respect of the delay. IP address won't be useful for probabilistic attribution. But what it does allow you to do is to do region. So you get region for free, because from the IP address, you'll know that it's USA, New York. You won't know it's downtown Manhattan, but you get some, some data for free, almost from SKA. So that's the entire cycle of attribution. At no yeah. point there was the MMP involved. So where the MMPs do add value is each of the ad networks can pass the SKA conversion data to the MMP to then start trying to gather and represent that data in a meaningful way to the marketeers. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, from what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the matching for attribution purposes of the clicks happens on the device by the SCAD network code and the attribution gets sent to the advertiser and the MMP could be a front for the advertiser to pick up the post back and aggregate it across multiple advertisers. Is that understanding correct? That is correct. I have one slight fine tune on what you've said. So the attribution is done on the device by the Apple operating system. It figures out who was the last click and who should I send the post back to. The post back is sent to the ad network, not to the advertiser. Because of that variable, we've got another dynamic, which is it are all ad networks willing to share their post back data with an MMP? Of course we are. But there's a bigger question, is Google and Facebook willing to share their granular SK data with the MMPs? At the moment, it seems no, but we're hoping that they are. Huh. Otherwise, yeah. it's very hard to build value about gathering all, everyone's data if the two gorillas don't share. Right. Anything. It's my understanding that you can see SK network data from Google and Facebook in the MMP dashboards, or are you saying the individual post back? Are you referring to individual post Yeah, it's so a granular. So yes. what I understand okay. at the moment, high level, Facebook believe they have drove a thousand installs from that campaign ID. I see. How it's split out, I believe at the moment, now I'm sure the MMPs have got different views and they're probably progressing each day. But the industry and all of us will definitely want the SRMs to share granular data, either with MMPs or with the advertisers themselves. Some advertisers are going to be in the SKA data. My point is it should be granular. You know, we'll share see. every single post back, we'll share that with Singular and an apps flyer. The question is, will Facebook share each level yeah. of data? Yeah. Yeah. Help folks understand what difference that's going to make. It's a good question. So it all comes down to how a marketer is going to be comparing. Because compared to what we all do today, you've got finite granularity, finite LTV forecasting, you know, every single cohort that's going in, you know, in every different um, kind of performance direction. What we're limited to now is ad networks A, B, and C are going to be compared by, let's just say they've driven 100 installs each. What is important is that you actually understand what of the conversion values they've driven. Now, those conversion values will mean different things to different advertisers, but let's just imagine that one is tutorial completion, level five, level 10, deposit, right? Those are my different conversion values. How ad networks will be judged, certainly in the short term, I believe, will be, right, you've driven 100 installs. How many conversion event one, two, and three have you driven? Now, for the MMPs to represent that, they actually need that granular data given to them, not just the weekly aggregate report sent to them. So it's the granular level data will allow better understanding of a very limited new attribution system. So the limitations are significant. The point is that we hope that every ad network will share that granular data so that it can be, so a limited world can actually be sliced and diced as well as it can be. And you're saying Facebook and Google could get away with giving aggregate data. 
this doesn't come from first-hand knowledge today. I'm just aware that in the past, you know, it's usually been the SRNs that are far more sensitive about sharing any of what they consider their data. Yeah. Because yeah. the SK postback is sent to them, arguably it is their data. Even just looking at impression tracking, Facebook and Google have never allowed any third-party impression tracking. There's a precedent or a history in SRNs not providing the granularity that the industry needs. Yeah. I'm just highlighting there's this other, I won't quite call it an elephant in the room because we're all talking about it. It's more, Certainly. you know, and this is very early, but I, I suspect that they will be sharing that granular data with the MMPs. And, and, and if they don't, well, maybe they'll share it with the advertiser that's spending all their money with them. It's certainly a topic to be tracked is do the SRN granular SKA data. Certainly, I think that's going to be an important thing to look out for going forward. To switch gears a bit, can you tell us what is Info.p list? Oh. Why is that important? Where does that live? Why should people care? Absolutely. It was good that I described the mechanics of attribution beforehand because there's different requirements. Now, where I mentioned the demand side has got to register with Apple to get the SK signature, what the demand side also has to do is provide their signature to the SSPs on the supply side. I'll just take MoPub as an example. They're a great mediation SSP. So each of the ad networks would have provided the supply side SDKs, MoPub, AppLove, and Google, with their signature. Now that signature goes in to the ad serving SDK, which actually puts each signature in the info dot p list configuration file within that app i'll give you an example if a publisher may be ska compatible and they may have five ad networks in their p list that means that they will be able to track ska for those four or five ad networks only so it's actually important that the supply side publishers are ensuring that their latest SDK from Fiber or Mopub or, or whoever, it is the latest one because the latest one will include all of the ad networks SK signatures in the P list. So what the P list is, is a list of registered demand side ad networks. That I is see. what the P list is. I see. And let's say you had to test a new ad network or a DSP. Should you assume it is already registered by the SSP? And for folks who may not be familiar, an SSP is an exchange, and right? you're talking about the same thing. If I, as an advertiser, was onboarding a new DSP, is there anything I would have to do? Yes, there's certainly far more considerations than what we're used to today. But also the considerations today, I'm sure, are going to normalize over the coming months. But the status we're in at the moment, first of all, not all publishers are SK compatible yet. We see about 35% of the bids that we're receiving are SK compatible. Now, yeah. even within that 35%, there's another variable, which is, well, how many of that 35% have included data seat in the P list? So those are the two major variables that equals, well, how much of the traffic is trackable by SKA? So mm -hmm. just because we were predicting this, we're very early on to register with SKA, we've ensured that our signature is in all of the exchange SSP. So I know that our SK signature is in the P list for all of them. But for one of your members or audience that's thinking of running with a new DSP, they must ask them currently, what percentage of your traffic is SK compatible? And which SSPs have implemented your signature in their P list? These two things are important now. In six, 12 months time, it will be less so because- Actually. Everything yeah. will propagate. It just yeah. takes time to, for the percentages to increase. But this is an issue now. It should go away in, in months' time. Certainly, certainly. And when you say bids are SKI network compatible, what has to happen for an impression or a traffic source to be SKI network compatible? It's a broader question. Excuse me, I'm not the actual coding engineer that's implementing this, but I know the principles. So there's two things that they'll have to do is make sure that their app itself is iOS 14 compatible. Every developer, whether they're a publisher, an advertiser, or both would have been going through that process. That's the first thing. And most of either have or already doing it. But the second thing is what we've mentioned already is that if they're monetizing, they have to make sure they've got the latest 
supply side SDK that includes those P lists. But as long as they've done that, then every ad impression they have that is going through to the exchanges that then goes through to the demand side auctions, they will all appear as SK compatible. And what does compatible mean? It, in the bid request, we will just see an SK parameter, which tells us that we can bid on it and that we are trackable. So it's not much difference in the bid stream itself, other than there's a variable that allows us to identify that that publisher and impression is trackable by SKA. And when iOS 14 rolls out, a far higher percentage of those bids won't have an IDFA. But so, so yeah. there's not much difference between a bid yesterday compared to a bid in a, a couple of weeks' time, other than a very significant proportion will have no IDFA, which is the same as lap traffic today. Yeah, exactly. With the distinction that there's a flag, if I might say so, that says this is SCAD network compatible, which means the BSP is populated in the P list. And it means this impression can be tracked via SCAD network. It is, and we're in this interesting period, which I call no man's land, really, because we all know this is happening, but it hasn't yeah. happened yet. We're all scrambling to get ready. The supply side, from our perspective, is 35% ready, but it's increasing at a far steeper rate now, which is a positive thing. Yeah. It was yeah. concerning a couple of weeks ago when it was at 20%, but it's taken a big, a big jump recently as the supply side's been pushing their publishers to top grade. Right. But the no man's land is today, we've got a mix of SK trackable, non-SK trackable, and we have multiple attribution methods. Today, we've got... IDFA matching, deterministic, you've got fingerprinting, and you've got SKA. This is why I call it no man's land, because we don't really know. We're using all three combinations yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, now, now yeah. what I strongly expect happen that we've discussed about in the past, and you've probably seen articles from me, is we strongly expect that fingerprinting will disappear pretty quickly after ATT rolls out. It's not this mix anymore. Very quickly, yeah. the whole world will become SKA only. Yeah. And actually, I'd say bring it on because this period of uncertainty and using these three different methods and they don't de -ju really, we just need to get to the new standard as quickly as possible from my perspective. Yeah, in a programmatic bid, there's a bid request and a bid response and there are like a number of variables that are currently passed. What changes in those bid requests and responses post IS 14? It's a really interesting question because there's two parts of it. The first part of it, not much has changed in the bid request. But what happened on the demand side logic has changed hugely. So yes. first part of my statement, not much has changed. All that's changed in the bid request is there'll be a lot less idea phase and the percentage that is SK trackable is going to go up. Literally the bid request looks the same apart from one or two small variables. Not much changes from what's incoming. What has changed drastically is the logic that the demand side will be using to bid. Now, what has been happening for the majority of the past five, ten years is that the bidding logic has been based on behavioral data. So the majority of ad networks and DSPs out there would have been collecting IDFA data from the bid stream, from suppression lists, or if you're lucky enough yeah. to be an SRN, you're sent everyone's device IDs. So the status quo of the industry has pretty much been whoever has most data wins. So example, bid request comes in. If that ad network or DSP is running a match three campaign for an advertiser, they're trying to say, well, what do we know about this bid? Oh, it's a match three whale. We know it because we've learned that from our other clients. They'll bid super high. That's what I call behavioral based bidding. That's over, or rather it's going to drastically reduce from the majority to the very small minority, which then means it's not scalable and not lucrative, so it'll probably fizzle out to nothing. So what's the new norm? The bid request comes in, and the logic behind the demand side has got to be, right, what have we learnt from our one advertiser for this one campaign? And the type of things that you learn contextually is which publishers have the best conversion rates. What day of the week? What time of the day? Which creative? What geography? Is it Idaho, New York, or California? So these are contextual variables. So what does change is that bidding logic. And within milliseconds, you get a bid request. Within milliseconds, 
our algorithms will run and my peers and competitors that have got this right will do the same. They'll go, right, well, because this is this publisher on a Saturday at 8 p.m. on Wi-Fi in New York, I'm willing to bid $18. So it's the logic on the demand side that has changed, yeah. not really the bid stream itself. Yeah. And is that a shift that's already happened for web programmatic or is there still some model of behavioral bidding happening right there? And I asked to understand if there's a precedent that mobile advertisers can use to understand and model potential impact of what this might mean to that. It's a good question because actually my previous business was Addict Tracking, which is an MMP which was acquired by Critio. So I was at Critio for four years, building their mobile business. But actually my experience there was ITP happened. IT, mm -hmm. Intelligent Tracking Prevention on Safari, mm -hmm. which was ITP1 and then ITP2, which was even worse. So I've experienced it there. Now, on the web, the similar thing with cookies had a very detrimental effect on retargeting. But on the web, user acquisition wasn't driven by the same device graph cross pollination cowboy lands that in app is in the web it was unheard of or rather it was deemed criminal to cross yeah. one advertiser's data with another it was unheard of yeah. and if the company did it they I would see. get banned or audited or punished what's matured in the in-app world it just became normal and then the SRNs that drove it. SRNs got all sent device IDs from everyone. Well, if you're an ad yeah. network or DSP that had to compete with Facebook or Google, well, guess what? You also had to gather the similar amounts of data. So actually, yeah. the detrimental effects of ITP on web are far smaller than the detrimental effects of IDFA deprecation on UA in-app. Because UA in-app, is all about whoever has most data wins. That wasn't the case on the web. Yeah, and I'm reminded of what you said in our last episode, which is that, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I think you said a lot of web advertisers are shocked at the amount of cross-pollination of data because all UA on mobile is like retargeting on the web, very deterministic in ways that a lot of web advertisers would still find shocking. I think they would, but it's interesting if you witness how this has matured because ad networks and DSPs didn't ever go to an advertiser and say, uh, can you share all your device IDs with me so I can put them in my device graph and drive profitable campaigns to your competitors? If they said that, the marketeer would go, oh, I'm pretty sure I can't do that or I'm going to get in trouble. If you said that to the chief privacy officer, they'd red card you and say no chance. But those discussions never happened. What did yeah. happen, I'm an SRN drag and drop in your MMP. Woohoo, I've got all the data. And you've signed the Google and Facebook terms, which means that they can do whatever the hell they like with the data. Yeah. Now, the ad networks and DSPs, you know, they said, just said, well, send us a suppression list. You're working with us on an arbitrage. They're selling installs. It's only fair that that arbitrage ad network doesn't serve adverts to existing users that they're not going to get paid for. Yeah. So suppression lists were easy. Yeah, I can send you a suppression list. What wasn't ever discussed was the, what's often in the fine print was whatever yeah. data is derived from using our platform, we are the data controller. That's legal language that says, if you send me a suppression list, it's ours, we own it. Yeah. And that is what led to the situation we're in. And my view is that is Apple's biggest issue with IDFA. IDFA was created for attribution in, 20, in 2012, and that was a legitimate use for IDFA. Yeah. What happened yeah. was SRNs, suppression lists, whoever has most data wins, and those that did win made tens of billions of dollars, and that yeah. is what Apple likes. That's my view. And I do think it yeah. was a huge breach of consumer privacy. Consumers never yeah. said to an advertiser, you can share my device ID with 10, 20, 100 different ad networks. I do believe Apple's position is right, albeit to the detriment of every mobile Certainly. marketeer. Yeah, and I think you're also right to point out the role of the SRNs or SANs, uh, as you will, because Facebook and Google's position has always been, this is our data. Advertiser data is our data. We own the data. It's, they treated it as first-party data that mm -hmm. they were free to use to cross-target users across different apps for whatever reason, that's never been questioned until now. 
and I can see why all of that has led up to this point. It, it's, it's a classic example of where I actually think self-regulation, capitalist self-regulation doesn't work. You know, don't get me wrong, I am a capitalist. I'd rather self-regulate myself than have, have a clueless government body do it. But there's two examples. Facebook, Google that set this data standard, whoever has most data wins. That's a terrible example or, or a good example of where capitalism and self-regulation doesn't work. That wasn't GDPR and CCPA legal. It isn't. But then what Apple have now imposed, I believe, actually goes beyond GDPR and CCPA. So actually, we then see another, you know, the most successful capitalist organization in the world, actually now imposing privacy, apparently law. But I see that actually what is happening with all of the delays and the privacy thresholds, it goes way beyond GDPR and CCPA. In fact, the, the whole pop-up, I think, is a bit too aggressive. That they're, they're actually yeah. going to be a, a law enforcing. But still, I think it's better than the environment that we were Certainly. in. Certainly. Certainly, you're right to point out that Apple is a capitalist profit-making organization driven by its own incentives. And I think that's certainly a larger conversation. But to our broader discussion that we were having earlier, I think one aspect that is a bit of a question mark for a lot of people is mobile web. Mobile web, especially on programmatic, has always been a part of the inventory. And that's not governed by a SCAD network. So what happens to mobile web inventory or impressions that come in as a part of DSP traffic going forward? I actually see it as an opportunity. And actually, mobile web as an underbought inventory source has actually been an opportunity even today. It can't be tracked with IDFA, so it would be fingerprinted. And actually, we run some campaigns for clients on mobile web, and the performance is good. It's tracked by fingerprinting. Let's just... So ATT rolls out. SKA, you rightly point out, is not compatible, cannot track mobile web traffic. It can only track a download that comes from an in-app publisher, not a mobile web publisher. So and the question is, can app advertisers still run on mobile web? The answer is yes, they can. Next question is, can it be tracked by SKA? No, it can't. All right, well, can it be tracked by anything else? So just looking at web, whether it's desktop or mobile, it doesn't actually matter. There's two ways that you can track any web traffic to an outcome, and that is with a cookie or by fingerprinting. So my view is that advertisers should, and I know the majority are, try and get a percentage opt-in. Because let's just say that advertiser A gets 20% opt-in. That actually means that 20% can be fingerprinted. So opt-in isn't just for IDFA. The ATT opt-in option is to say, you can track me from other sites and apps not owned by this company. So track me does mean fingerprinting. It means IDFA traffic or email matches, whatever. So my view on mobile web is advertisers should try and get as high an opt-in as possible. They should run on mobile web. They should fingerprint those users that have opted in. And then you extrapolate up. So let's just say yeah. they're running a mobile web campaign. They have 20% opt-in. That led to 100 installs. It is a completely fair statistical method to say, well, 20% led to my 100 installs. Therefore, I 5 x that. And that was my total performance. I see. And that still requires some amount of estimation and good faith, I for, imagine. For sure. My point is your choices are don't run on it. Run on it blind or run on it with some opted in traffic that gets fingerprinted. You've at least got some data that you can then weight up based on the percentage. I see. I see. Um, but I think it is an opportunity because it is underbought cheaper in you know, So there are good quality users out there and I think it is worth advertisers experimenting with. I see. Would you say it's going to be cheaper than contextual buys after Apple pulls the trigger? It will be cheaper because I, I would expect the contextual CPMs also to crash. So CPMs in app and on mobile web, I do believe will be lower in a post ATT world. I'm expecting in app CPM to drop more significantly in the mobile web. Why? Because it's that in app inventory that's had the device graph, what I call the $50 snipers. If you know it's a max three whale, you bid 50 bucks, right? That's all app to app. So what's been disrupted most 
is the demand into app inventory. Those device graphs were rarely bidding in mobile web because there wasn't a IDFA to identify them. Now, some smart companies had done a cross device graph, which was to match an IDFA to a cookie. So actually when they saw a cookie on mobile web, they'd know, oh, that's the IDFA, it's my match three whale. But that was a lot less prolific than in-app. So I'm expecting in-app CPMs to drop more than mobile web, but mobile web CPMs were a lot lower in the first place. I see. Interesting. This is all very fascinating, David. And I think we have come up on time. So this is perhaps a good place for us to wrap. But before we do that, could you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? Sure. Um, you know, I've introduced myself before, but uh, my name, again, my name is David Phillips, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dataseat. We are an in-house DSP. We're focused predominantly in the gaming space. Look me up, dataseat.com uh, or on LinkedIn, or listen to the numerous podcasts and my big mouth that likes to talk about these subjects in such detail. Matt, thank you for inviting me to your show. Podcast. I've enjoyed contributing. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you for your fabulous insights. Certainly very unique perspectives. Excited to put these out into the world very soon. For more tips, pointers, and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition, subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog.